I'm Dr. Nathaniel Chin, and you're listening to Dementia Matters, a podcast about Alzheimer's disease. Dementia Matters is a production of the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. Our goal is to educate listeners on the latest news in Alzheimer's disease research and caregiver strategies. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to this bonus episode of Dementia Matters, where we continue our conversation with Dr. Howie Rosen on frontal temporal dementia. On last week's episode, Dr. Rosen and I talked about the genetic risk factors, trajectories, and familiar caregiving experiences of frontal temporal dementia, also referred to as FTD. If you didn't hear that episode, I encourage you to go back and listen. In this bonus episode, our conversation about FTD turns to research. We discuss research into how the disease affects self-awareness, biomarkers and early detection, and how people can volunteer for a research study. Now here's the episode. I'd like to move into the research realm of frontal temporal dementia. And you're looking at how this disease affects self-awareness, as well as how imaging and other biomarkers can be used to track the disease in the brain over time. So can you explain to us how and why frontal temporal dementia affects a person's self-awareness and, and what you've found in your research? It's a great question. And uh, of course, the ultimate answer is we don't know. Um, but I, I mean, I'll point out first, it's a particularly relevant question to FTD because so one of the things we know about all degenerative diseases is they usually get to a point, if they affect the mind, that the person with the disease doesn't have the, may understand they have a problem, but they don't, if, if they do, they don't understand the degree to which it's affecting them at some point. So a person even with moderate Alzheimer's might acknowledge they have memory problems, but not realize that it's gotten to the point where they can't do their own taxes or, or that they don't understand why they're not doing their own taxes. And they might acknowledge their son's doing it, but they might say, it's because I asked them to, which really wasn't the case. So that's true in everything. But in frontotemporal dementia, this lack of self-awareness comes quite early, and it's much more common than in Alzheimer's or any other degenerative disease. So there's something uh, we believe about the regions of the brain and which regions are affected that is the cause of this um, loss of self-awareness. I think what it teaches us is that there are regions of the brain that do this and that their job is monitoring and, and helping us to understand when we've made a mistake uh, or when we've done something that, uh, that needs correction. And those regions must get hit more so in frontotemporal dementia. My research actually connected is this to the emotional problem. I always like to give the analogy, you know, like if you grew up in the United States and you're my age, in my 50s, um, if you played soccer very well, wasn't a particularly important thing. So if you weren't a great soccer player, nobody really cared. But if you couldn't hit a baseball, that was a big deal. So what, And so what we know is if you're on the soccer field and maybe you didn't play so well, a lot of us would just let that slide. But if you know you struck out on the baseball diamond, you would really get angry at yourself and, and that might motivate you to work harder and to go to the batting cage or whatever. The point is that emotions actually play a lot of role in our self-monitoring and they help us to decide whether we need to change or not change. And so the inference might be that when our emotions aren't there, we may notice that we make a mistake but not care. And so essentially, you know, a lot of a lot of the way we might decide we're not the same person we were is if we've seen certain of our actions happen and they didn't come out the way they're supposed to. We say, I guess I'm not good at memory anymore or language anymore. But because that part of the brain that's supposed to care about those things doesn't work, it might kind of ignore those things. They happen, I know they happen, but I don't care. And therefore, why would I come to the conclusion that something's wrong with me, even if I made a few extra mistakes? So it's really something maybe unique about emotions and their role in our self-monitoring that I think FTD might be teaching us. And that was sort of some of the work I was doing there. Now, some of the other work that, you, that you're, you're currently doing is looking at biomarkers and tracking disease. Right. And I speak to a lot of researchers about biomarkers of Alzheimer's disease. So right. we talk about this amyloid protein, the tau protein, and the shrinkage of the brain center, the mm -hmm. hippocampus. What biomarkers do you have in frontal temporal yeah. dementia? 
So, so um, I think you were going to get to ask me about any biomarkers for the protein specifically. Yeah. So the two proteins, tau and TDP43, we unfortunately don't have any specific biomarkers for those proteins yet. And in fact, there are some PET scans and other blood tests that are being developed to detect the tau in Alzheimer's disease that are, look very promising. But unfortunately, we now know that it, they probably don't label the kind of tau in FTD very well. So we really have to go back to the drawing board, which we are doing, to try to develop those biomarkers. Um, uh, there are some promising hints and developments, but we're not there yet. So the biomarkers we do have include, um, uh, well, I consider cognitive and neuropsychological testing somewhat of a biomarker, and as I said, that has its value. Um, brain imaging with uh, that images the structure of the brain, so atrophy and you know how how basically how much brain there is. You can measure that and quantify it, and and that uh, uh, is a valuable biomarker. Um, it certainly, the more atrophy you have, we know the more symptoms you have in any disease. So we therefore, the less atrophy you have, or the more atrophy you prevent in a study, that might indicate that you're going to prevent uh, cognitive decline or social and emotional decline. Um, uh, so I think, and there are other related things, uh, other kinds of uh, more sophisticated imaging techniques. I don't know if you've ever talked about, there's imaging of the white matter that we do called diffusion imaging and, and uh, uh, this thing called functional MRI where you actually look at uh, activity of the nerve cells indirectly and those things are also relevant in frontotemporal degeneration. And we're doing our best to creatively use those in the most useful way possible. Um, uh, and that's what we have right now. Is oh, there's another one called neurofilament light chain. Have you ever talked about that one? Mm -hmm. So neurofilament light chain uh, turns out, I think it's going to be an extremely valuable uh, marker in all neurodegenerative disease. And what's good is that that's not limited to Alzheimer's disease, but it's true in frontotemporal degeneration too. It, it seems to be it's a marker uh, in the um, that indicates somehow, and we don't really understand all the details, that nerve cells are being injured. Um, we could detect it in the spinal fluid, so you do a spinal tap to find that. But what's really really good about neurofilament light change is it can also be detected in the blood, and it has the same value detecting it in the blood as it does in the spinal fluid. So it's really going to be a valuable. But it, obviously, because it goes up in front to temporal generation and in Alzheimer's, you can't use it to decide which of those diseases that you have. But if you're worried that somebody's getting one and you want to see if that's really true or not, it might be that a, like a low level of neurofilament might suggest that these symptoms that you're hearing are not related to a neurodegenerative disease. We have some work to do to figure out how true that might be or not, but that would be a good use of them. There is a study that's been published which compared people with frontotemporal degeneration to other people who had psychiatric illness with some overlapping symptoms um, and showed that the neurofilament level was much higher in the frontotemporal degeneration group. I think to conclude that's always going to be the case is tricky, but, but it, it's promising. So, yeah. Now, in Alzheimer's disease, and according to how we view it, amyloid protein develops that leads to problems in the brain and then tau develops. So there's that sequence. Mm -hmm. Do you see TDP43, that abnormal protein, first leading to changes that, that cause this different version of tau? Well, so the problem is, you, as you might guess, I can't answer that because we can't measure the TDP43 protein in life. And so it, um, we don't even... In fact... Um, uh, we have a big problem with uh, frontotemporal generation because um, certain kinds of presentation symptoms, uh, certain kinds of symptoms are very closely associated with one of the proteins. So if you have that weird kind of language problem where you don't recognize words and can't think of words that I mentioned, almost always that at autopsy turns out to sh have the TDP43 protein. So even in life, if that's the symptom you have, I know what protein's causing the problem. In the kind of FTLD where you have the social and emotional problems, it turns out that about half the cases have tau and half the cases have TDP43, and we have no real way to predict which one it is right now. So it's just another example of how important that kind of biomarker is. 
Uh, I think um, the first place uh, we're gonna that's gonna teach us more about that is the genetic di- divergence. So um, there there's a large project in Europe called Genfi, the Genetic Frontotemporal Dementia Initiative, and we have a similar project in the U.S. called All FTD which is, a, I won't even tell you what the acronym's for, um, but all FTD and Genfi are both enrolling lots of patients, people, not patients. In other words, uh, doctors use the word patient when somebody has symptoms, but we try to avoid using it when somebody's fine. You're a person. Um, patients are people too, needless to say. Um, so we're enrolling people who are in these families, including people who have the mutation and are not affected, they seem to be fine, as well as people who have the mutation and already are affected. And we're and enrolling family members who are in the family but don't have the mutation. And through enrolling all those people, it's gonna help to teach us about what the earliest manifestations of these diseases are. And that group is a group where we're working very hard to make sure if there's any, um, any uh, um, useful biomarker that we're testing in these groups because if you have a certain mutation, we know what protein you're going to develop and um, and uh, even before you get it um, in theory. So I think we are going to learn something about, about the evolution of these diseases and as the biomarker develops, which biomarker, which protein happens when and how that relates to symptoms. One of my ending questions for you is really what can people do if, if they're worried or they, they want to contribute to research, and it seems like that website in the United States is one of the places to go. The Association for Front to Temporal Degeneration, or, or AFTD. Um, also, there's a Front to Temporal Dis- Dementia Disorders Registry, which kind of has its own website, but it's related to that too. So I think if you look up um, uh, AF, AF as in Frank, TD, uh, and dementia, you'll probably land on this AFTD. That's probably enough of a search. Or frontotemporal dementia. Um, that one, it might not be in the first 10 of the Google search. I hope it is. But, you know, sort of keep an eye out for this AFTD or the Association for Frontotemporal Degeneration. And are there other ongoing clinical studies that people can register for or enroll? Um, yes. Uh, well, so all FTD, for instance, is a multi-site study that is involving 19 sites around the U.S. All FTD also has a website, allftd.org, and um, uh, uh, but it may be that there are lots of centers like this one, for instance, that might have a related study, but they're not part of all FTD, and that's why I think. Um, looking at the All FTD website would be great, but I also think looking at you have to be familiar with AFTD because they would have a, even a broader knowledge of kind of the resources in the U.S. and Canada and Mexico, etc., that might be relevant. Well, well, Dr. Rosen, thank you for for spending time with us and shedding light on this very important disease that we don't often talk about and needs to be discussed. And so, with that, I'd like to have you come on again in the future. But thank you for being here today. Thanks very much. I'm, I was happy to do it, and I hope it was useful, and it was fun. Dementia Matters is brought to you by the Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center. The Wisconsin Alzheimer's Disease Research Center combines academic, clinical, and research expertise from the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and Public Health and the Geriatric Research Education and Clinical Center of the William S. Middleton Memorial Veterans Hospital in Madison, Wisconsin. It receives funding from private, university, state, and national sources, including a grant from the National Institutes of Health for Alzheimer's Disease Centers. This episode was produced by Rebecca Wazaleski and edited by Abishir Adin. Our musical jingle is Cases to Rest by Blue Dot Sessions. Check out our website at adrc.wisc.edu. You can also follow us on Twitter and Facebook. If you have any questions or comments, email us at dementiamatters at medicine.wisc.edu. Thanks for listening.